All right, thank you. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Thanks, Victorville, for showing up. I want to welcome our other sites as well. Out in Apple Valley and Phelan and Hesperia, our online audience. Everybody. We're just glad everybody's here. Um, okay, uh, I got my tea, so uh, I'm good to go. We're going to go to physics class today, so you're going to need to batten down the hatches a little bit. Put our thinking caps on, as we often say. Uh, Worldview, how we see the world, how we perceive life and God, and that's what this series is about. Ground Zero, of course, is God himself, and uh, the question that we want to try to answer today is how can you know that God exists? The short answer is it depends on how much evidence you need, but we'll get into that as we uh, make our way through presentation. Okay, my father, who's been with the Lord for the last seven years, pastor for a long time, and uh, he used to say certain things over and over, and I remember them for that reason. And one of his, one of his ideas is that God gave everybody a brain with just so many cylinders, <laughs> and, and some of us got four cylinders, and some of us got six cylinders, and some of us got eight cylinders. And his point was that we just have to make sure that we fire on all cylinders. Whatever God gave us, make sure we maximize the gift and the capability uh, because we all have different levels, especially when it comes to understanding things. I, I don't know how many cylinders I have. He never told me. Uh, but I often find myself wishing I had at least one more. And so when we talk about things related to the world of astrophysics, I wish I had one or two or 12 more cylinders to work with I believe, though, that the world of, of physics, especially astronomy and physics, astrophysics, is the greatest apologetics arena for this generation. It is the best defense of the faith for you young people who are studying in school and involved and interested in the world of scientific discovery. When I was a kid, it wasn't astronomy, it was archaeology. And if you're older, perhaps you remember those apologetics events or or um, presentations where somebody would stand up, try to help you understand better why we believe the Bible is true, and then they would elevate some discovery in archaeology that confirmed the biblical record. Well, that was true when I was young, but make no mistake, bro, it's astrophysics now. It's what's going on in the cosmos that is giving us the best description of God's existence than that, that we have and have ever had, actually. If I did have a few more cerebral cylinders, this is who I'd be. I'd be this guy right here. <laughs> I would be like a physics professor because I love, I love this stuff. The culture we live in has told us that there are, there are these two disciplines. You got science and you got the Bible. You got science and theology. And you have to make a choice. Which one are you going to go with? It's almost like what science is discovering has discounted what the Bible teaches. And so, as scientific discovery grows, they're able to manage public perception of the Christian faith, marginalizing us as some kind of old-fashioned, blindly following, some kind of voodoo belief system group of people. And the truth is, you don't have to make a choice between science and scripture at all. And young people hear me. If you're ever told that in your science class, you challenge that statement because it is false. Truth is what we're after, and it does not change identity simply because it's contained in different books. Both scientists and theologians are after the same thing, man. We just want to know the truth. And the God who wrote the Bible is the same God who created everything. And since all science does is study what God created, you would expect there would be perfect consistency between literature that he wrote and what we discover about what he made. In our quest for what is true, however, whether you're a scientist or a theologue, there's always going to be a need for faith. Scientists have faith too. They actually don't like it when I tell them that because they don't call it faith. They call it hypothesis. Now, let me tell you what a hypothesis is. 
By definition, and I just take this out of the dictionary, I mean, I'm not making this stuff up. It's a supposition made on the basis of faith, limited evidence that's used as a starting point for more research, for further investigation. Scientists believe something might be true. They believe it, it might even probably be true, but they haven't confirmed it yet, and so more investigation is required. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of things, pretty impressive list of things that we no longer believe, but science once declared as fact. For example, we now know that the Earth is not the center of the universe. We know that. We also know that uh, the Earth is not flat. I don't know if you knew that, but we figured that out. We also know that the universe is not, is not static, but it is expanding. See, what good science does is it creates an idea, an hypothesis. They take something based on, on faith. And then they take a closer look at it to see if it is actually truth. They just go where the evidence leads them. That's good science. It's also good theology. God is not afraid of scientific discovery. Somehow God has been framed as this guy who is hoping scientists don't figure anything out. In fact, God is mad at people who want to suppress the truth. God wrote the truth. He didn't want people <laughs> to not get it. See, I've, I've told you for a long time. You know this. I told you, I told you, I told you. Follow the numbers and you'll eventually get to the truth. Follow the data and eventually you'll end up with the truth. So when people ask me a question, they say, well, Pastor Tom, can you prove that God exists? My response is, I don't even want to prove that God exists because proof requires no faith. And the Bible is very clear. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now watch the scientific process unfold in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to God must believe that he exists. Now we establish a hypothesis that God exists and then he rewards those who are digging deeper and looking further for evidence. He rewards those who earnestly seek truth. See, God's not afraid of science. God invented it. Now proof, talk about proof. Can you prove God exists? Proof is different than having confidence in something. Confidence grows as evidence mounts, but I'm telling you guys, there's always gonna be room, conversations like this one, there's always gonna be room for even a little bit of faith. God requires faith to make him happy. Without faith, you can't please God. See, could God just prove to everybody that he's real? Of course he could. He'd just show up in some you know, intergalactic firestorm, and then we'd all say, yikes. Okay, you proved it to us. But God has chosen not to prove it because he wants us to have what? He wants us to have faith. And if faith is needed at any level, then you haven't yet proven something. So I don't want to give you proof, but I do want to give you a couple of formulas to consider. The first one is this. Here we go. I just can't get over that myself. It is a little creepy. Here we go. <laughs> proof equals evidence minus faith. You need, no, you need no faith for proof because you've got sufficient evidence. In fact, we got what I call the happy jar or the happy glass. This is a glass jar and it's filled with green substance. Now, the green today is going to represent evidence. When you have sufficient evidence that it squeezes out any need for faith, you're happy because now you know something. It's proven. Now, you may not like what's proven, but I'm saying you're happy because if you're seeking truth, there you have it. But here's another uh, formula to consider. No confidence equals less evidence. You don't have much evidence, and it requires so much faith. So we got our happy jar again because it's full. If the jar is full, we're happy. But it's a combination now. It's a combination of the faith. It takes a lot of faith, and you only have a little bit of evidence. Now, you can still have faith if you want, and if you do. If you've got a sufficient combination that it fills the glass, you're still happy. But I'm looking at that saying, that's not, that's not, that's not good to me because I'm, I'm an idiot. I need, I need a little more evidence because like the disciples told Jesus, you're going to have to increase our faith because we can't fill up the jar. If we have a little evidence and a little faith, there's a lot of unhappiness here. 
So here's another formula. You guys like formulas? All right, welcome to class. Confidence, confidence. And this is the thing today. I'm not gonna prove God's existence, but when you walk out of the room, whatever room you're in today, when you get up and walk away from your, uh, your laptop watching this online, I want you to have confidence because there is so much more evidence than you think, and it doesn't require much faith. See, when I think about the existence of God, I'm thinking, why wouldn't anybody believe in God? There's so much evidence. It doesn't even take much faith. But there will always be some faith. So if you're looking for proof, sorry, you're out of luck. We're not going to prove anything because we want to please God. On the other hand, we are going to give you some evidence. Lots of evidence. Last week, the guys brought up our belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And uh, if you were here, uh, you heard a little about that. Now, the question is, can we prove the resurrection of Jesus happened? Well, no, we can't prove it. I can't prove it. I wasn't there. And if I were there, it would have only proven it to me. Wouldn't have proven it to you. So then you'd have to have faith in the possibility that I was believable if I was telling you that Jesus rose from the grave. See, we can't prove that. The only way that everyone could have proof that the resurrection actually took place is for everyone who has ever lived to have lived during that week in Jerusalem and have experienced those events for themselves. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but the evidence... Going to the next picture. The evidence, where's my happy jar? There we go. The evidence is so great for the bodily resurrection of Christ. It takes faith, but it doesn't take that much because the evidence is so significant. Significant enough to give us what? Confidence. See, we want confident believers. But at the same time, believers are only believers because they believe, because they have faith. People say, Pastor Tom, I have to have proof. Okay, why? Why, why do you need more for this discussion than you would for any other conversation? For example, our, our judicial system, our courtroom. Does a trial in a, in a courtroom prove somebody's guilty or innocent? No. Every jury is simply left to deliberate about an event they did not witness, consider evidence that they have been shown, and then make a conclusion that something is true beyond a reasonable doubt. I've got so much evidence about the existence of God that I can have faith it's true because that evidence gives me confidence beyond a reasonable doubt. I'm a reasonable guy. I'm not into blind faith. But I do want to have faith because I want to please God. But anyway, they come up with this verdict in a courtroom and it becomes an accepted explanation of the evidence that society presumes to be true. That's what a verdict is. And then the next decision that's, that's rendered, the sentence, a judge declares a sentence, and the sentence is declared as if the verdict actually reflected what happened, what actually took place. Even though when you think about it, nothing was absolutely proven. The judge wasn't there. Not one member of the jury was there when whatever it is they've been talking about during deliberations took place. But the verdict reflects the confidence of the jury to walk out of that courtroom and say, we came to a, a clear understanding of what actually took place. See, God, God wants us to have faith, but he doesn't want us to have that, that blind faith. When you think about it, if God wanted us to embrace a blind faith, he wouldn't have created a universe that shouts out to us every day about who he is. If God would have wanted us to embrace a blind faith, he wouldn't have placed us, the only galactic observers in the known universe, on the only galactic observation platform in the known universe, planet Earth. Had God not wanted us to be confident about who he was, he would not have sent us a son who, as the writer of Hebrews described, was the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his being. He wouldn't have done that. And if God would have wanted us to continue to just wonder about him, then he certainly wouldn't have written a 66-volume piece of literature that explains every one of his attributes in high def. God wants us to have confidence in what is true about him. In fact, he gets really ticked off when people suppress truth. 
when Paul wrote the Roman church, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the apostle said this, the wrath of God, and by the way, before we go any further, if you're dealing with the wrath of God, you're playing with dynamite, bro, and you don't want to go there. Have you read the Bible? Wrath of God gets you, G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi, it's ugly. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven <laughs> against godlessness and wickedness of people who do what? They suppress truth. God hates it when people suppress the truth. God wants us to understand the truth. And that's why he's given us so much evidence. He calls us to faith. But man, by the time we get done looking at this evidence, it's a baby step to God. A baby step of faith. And y'all can take that. There's nobody in any of these rooms that can say, oh man, on top of that evidence, Tom, it, it just still takes such a huge leap of faith. I don't know. I, I don't get that. I only have a few minutes to talk about a couple of evidences of God's existence, but you're going to have to determine if it's enough for you to take that step of faith. So we're going to begin with a scientific hypothesis. Ready? Okay. The hypothesis is this. God actually exists. Now let's, let's find out. Now let's follow the process of scientific discovery and let's find out if that's true. Exhibit A, you fill in some blanks. Exhibit A is the cosmos. The universe is the first thing we probably need to look at in this discovery process, and just the fact that it exists is a powerful thing. In fact, in fact when, when Paul was writing the Romans about how God got ticked off because people suppressed the truth, he goes on in verse 19 to say, say this, since what may be known about God is plain to them, is plain to everybody. Why? Because God made it plain. Since the creation of the world God's qualities, his attributes, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been what? Created. God says, scientists, you go, son, you go, girl. Get your science going here because I have made myself plain to you. And, and the point is, when you're done with the scientific process, you will have no excuse you will not be able to say, hey, we checked it out, Lord, and uh, you, you weren't there. You just weren't there. We're going to stand before God someday and say, I made it plain to you. You know, what's wrong? What's wrong with y'all? Anyway, the apostle's saying here, everybody's heard certain things from God. Everybody. They've heard that he exists. They've heard that he is powerful. He's powerful enough to create everything that exists. And, and these things that he has been telling us, no, notice what he says. They're clearly seen and, and they've been understood. Everybody understands it. Now, some people suppress the truth. It's up to you. What you want to do with truth is up to you, but you know the truth. Mauna Kea is a dormant volcano on the big island of Hawaii. And uh, I've had the privilege of being there. We've been there a couple times in recent years. It's actually the tallest mountain in the world, when it's measured from its oceanic base, it's over 33,000 feet high. It's one of the only places in the world where you can drive a car from sea level to 14,000 feet in a couple hours. And the combination of its elevation, its location in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and then its atmospheric composition, the combination of all those things make it the number one platform on planet Earth to observe the heavens. I remember the first time we, we went up there and uh, stopped the car, turned the lights off. I got out and I looked up and I started to cry. I never experienced anything like that. I mean, I live in SoCal, we live in the sticks, right? We can see the stars at night. Oh no, we can't. It was like one of those posters that have computer generated images of different galaxies. It was the most majestic and worshipful moment of my entire life. It was the, it's the no, number one attraction in the isle, islands of Hawaii, in my opinion, is Mauna Kea. God shouts from the heavens. And what he says to everybody is, what are you thinking? I don't exist. They call it a cosmological argument for God's existence. And, and this is it in a nutshell. It says that everything that exists had a cause outside of itself. In other words, you look at the heavens and you say, what caused it? This is cause, the world of cosmology, not cosmetology. <laughs> that would be the world of your hairstylist. And as you know, I got, I got no place in that world, right? 
Cosmology, on the other hand, tries to work out the wrinkles of our understanding of the cosmos, help us understand the cosmos better. And the cosmological argument for God's existence states this, that the universe exists, therefore there's a cause outside of it that made it exist. Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 says this, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Have you ever noticed that the Bible never argues for God's existence? The apostle Paul said everybody already knows God, God is this. The Bible is written with the assumption that the reader believes in God and then goes about its job of explaining this God to the audience, to the reader, explaining the God that he or she already believes exists. We know that the universe had a beginning just like Genesis 1-1 says. We know that now. Science has confirmed the beginning of the universe because it's winding down at a certain specific measurable rate. It's actually running out of steam. The universe is running itself out of gas. Now, if the humanist's view of the cosmos is correct, their manifesto states this, and I'm quoting, matter is self-existing and is not created. If that is true, then the universe would have to be able to maintain itself, to continue to regenerate itself, keep itself afloat. And science is now confirmed but that view is false. The laws of thermodynamics are now clearly established. The universe is winding down. It's not gearing up. It's not even maintaining its own. That discovery alone was a game changer. Astrophysicist, a guy named Hugh Ross, he wrote this and I'm quoting, astronomers who do not draw theistic or deistic conclusions are becoming rare now. And even the few dissenters hint that the tide is against them, end of quote. Probably not going to hear that in an astronomy class in a secular university because they suppress the truth. It doesn't fit their political agendas. Their ideology is more important to them than the truth. Robert Jastrow, who's another astronomer, he wrote this. I love this. I've loved this for a while. I'm quoting, for the scientist who has lived by his faith and the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He scaled the mountains of ignorance. He's about to conquer the highest peak. He pulls himself over the final rock, and he's greeted by a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries, end of quote. And by the way, every other creation model in every other religious holy book, every other collection of sacred writings from every other religion on earth they all say the same thing. They all say that time and space are eternal and absolute. And science has now confirmed that is not the case. But the universe is finite, expanding, but it's finite. You know the Bible is unique in proposing that time and space began at the very same time that matter and energy began in the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, and understand this, especially you young people, understand this. Physicists and astronomers around the world are at odds with every creation model presented by every religion except one. And that's the Bible. But once again, I would expect the book God wrote and the things that God made would be perfectly consistent. But this argument for God's existence brings up another logical question. You're going to have to tighten up your thinking caps a little more because this guy's coming back. If God is the cause of the universe and everything, it seems logically must have a cause, then who created God? And of course, you've got to get your deep, very <laughs> reverb kind of voice to say that God now becomes the uncaused cause. That sounds profound, doesn't it? Nobody caused God. But is there any evidence to support the belief in an uncaused, uncaused cause? Well, actually, yeah, there is some evidence. Let me show you what it is very briefly, very simply. We live in a four-dimensional reality. We've got three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Now, in a few weeks, I'm going to talk about miracles and why we believe in miracles. And we're going to talk about these three spatial dimensions of length, width, and height. 
So yeah, you can look forward to that. But anyway, today, we're just going to marginalize the three spatial dimensions, and we're going to focus on the singular time dimension that we have. That's the reality that we have. When it comes to time, there's only one dimension. The universe and everything in it are confined to what is actually a half dimension of time. That's why we use the term timeline. Everything had a beginning. That's why it's a half dimension, because it doesn't go the other way. Everything had a beginning. The universe, science tells us, as well as the Bible tells us, is going to blow up at some point, implode, however you want to describe it, it's going to come to an end. It's going to flame out. It's going to run out of gas. You got the beginning, you got the end, and then you got the you. You're all here. We're all here. And everything on that timeline had a cause. Everything that exists, everyone that exists, you can back up on that timeline and find out where it came from. But now we're saying, we're suggesting, if God is the uncaused cause, then he doesn't exist on that timeline. And if you can actually confirm that God exists off of that timeline, he can be an uncaused cause. Again, Hugh Ross, astrophysicist, he says this, he's a believer. He said this, and I'm quoting, the proof of creation lies in the mathematical observation that any entity confined to such a half dimension of time must have a starting point or a point of origin. The necessity for creation applies to the whole of the universe and ultimately everything in it. In other words, if there's something on this line, again, something before it made it happen. If God is confined to that timeline, then he too must have a cause. Somebody must have created God because everything on that line has a creator. Everything was caused by something that came before it. But if you or I or God could somehow step off of that timeline, then that principle of cause and effect would no longer be in play. Now, I, I know there's a lot to digest, but all the way back in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is writing the Philippian church. He's talking about how this God emptied himself. The Greek word is kenosis, which means emptying. And it describes how Jesus emptied himself and took the form of a man and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Maybe you've read the passage. It is so full of science, bro. I mean, there's great theology there. But again, with consistency between the two disciplines, it's all good. But in the kenosis, a God that existed off of that timeline actually stepped on to that singular dimension of time. And Jesus was what? He was born, and he lived his life, and he died. That's the emptying. That's the kenosis. The word, which is Jesus, John says, became flesh and made his dwelling where? Among us. He lived where we live. He lived in our singular time dimension of reality. He stepped onto our line. That was very emptying for God. He would give up some of his divine attributes that he could express freely by living in this multi-time dimensional reality and step on to our line. And then after the resurrection, what happened? You read the account after the resurrection and the behavior of Jesus is impossible to explain if you're living on a single time dimensional reality. His behavior is just, it's, not, it's just weird. It's like he just shows up places, see? It's, it's almost like he's no longer bound by the dimensional box that we live in. And that's because after the resurrection, the God who had stepped onto that line stepped off again. Now, when God created the cosmos, the first thing he said, first recorded words of God in the Bible, let there be what? Let there be light. In high ho there was light. God speaks, it happens, right? Did you know when he created light, what he did is he created this line? He created a line that said everything that happens here is going to happen at less than 186,000 miles per second, which, by the way, is the speed of light. Nothing in the universe moves faster than light. And what science has now told us is that if something or someone could operate faster than 186,000 miles per second, you know what would happen to them? they'd pop off of that line. Where would they go? Science cannot determine where they would go. They just know one thing, they would no longer be here. I guess the question then is not, 
Is God the uncaused cause? The question is, can God operate at a speed faster than the light he created? And if you believe in God, that's not much of a stretch. Okay, that's simple so far, right? All right, let's keep going. We got just a few more things to tell you. There's another argument for God's existence. Talk about the cosmological evidence for the fact that he exists. Let's look at the teleological argument for God's existence. And this is the teleological argument. It, it says, the universal phenomenon of design implies the existence of an original designer. When you look at something that's designed, you immediately think, oh man, somebody put that together. You go look for a new watch. You're looking through the case and you find, you find the watch you want and you look at it and say, man, I don't know who came up with this idea, but that individual is pretty amazing. I mean, great designer. Maybe mechanically it does things no other watch you've ever seen does. Teleos, Greek word. That's where we get this word teleological. Teleos in the Greek means perfect. And that's the point. When you look at the universe, you can look at the watch and say, man, that watch is perfect, right? You look at the universe, yikes, it's perfect, man. It is a well-oiled machine. It just works. The psalmist said in Psalm 19, verse 1, he said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands, the designer's hands. Day after day, the heavens pour forth speech. Man, they can't stop talking about what God has designed. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They don't like speak English or Hebrew or anything. They use no words, but, and no, no sound might even be heard from them. But I gotta tell you, they're, they're speaking clearly. The, the, the word cosmos, again, just pulling this out of the dictionary, Webster, defines cosmos this way. The universe thought of as an ordered and integrated whole. That's what the word means. Man, that's a machine. You know, last few days we've been shaking around here in SoCal. Raise your hand if you like earthquakes. Oh, you guys are weird. Most, most, most people get freaked out by them. Most people don't want them. You know, those of you who are seismologists, maybe you got something to do now, but I'm just saying that the rest of us are shaking around and we're thinking, man, this is no fun. You know, and our kids and our grandkids are freaking out and we just tell them, that's just the way it is in, in SoCal, especially, well, around the world, especially around the Pacific Rim. It's just the way life is. But on this point of God's design, I thought this would be a timely opportunity for me to just say a few things about the Earth's crust. The Earth's crust is four to 30 miles thick, and it consists of these group of tectonic plates. And you hear this terminology every time we have something over a four and a half. And we might hate earthquakes, but without them, did you know that you could not live? Human life would be impossible without earthquakes. It's the constant movement of those plates that generates the recycling of chemicals that allows complex life forms like us to even have life. One thing I would not want to be is at the base of a volcano when I'm blue. But even with volcanoes, same thing is true. It's the Earth's molten core and the liquid iron it contains that generates the magnetic field that actually serves as a protective cosmic shield around planet Earth. And all this talk about asteroids, all the asteroids that are hitting this protective shield and skip off into space. Because planet Earth has been designed, bro. And everything that happens here, I know it's jacked up, it's a little bit sideways because of sin, but the way God built this place, teleos. The fact that it is so ordered, so well built, tells us that there's an amazing designer behind it all. Fred Hoyle, who's an astronomer, and I love this quote, so I thought I'd throw it in again this time. He says this. Well, actually, it's a question. He asks a question. What are the chances that a tornado might blow through a junkyard containing all the parts of a 747, accidentally assemble them into a plane, and leave it ready for takeoff? So you've got all these millions of parts laying around. The wind blows through the junkyard, and when the clouds clear, you've got this perfectly designed, perfectly equipped, ready-to-fly 747 jet. You say, well, that's ridiculous. That would never happen. And he agrees. Possibilities of that happening are so small as to be negligible, even if a tornado were to blow through enough junkyards to fill the whole universe. End of quote. But I will tell you this. The chances of that happening are a lot better than the chances of the cosmos just coming together on its own. 
In fact, Professor Hoyle in his book entitled The Intelligent Universe, he says this, and I'm quoting, as biochemists discover more and more about the awesome complexity of life, it's apparent that it's Chances of originating by accident are so minute they can be completely ruled out. Life cannot have arisen by chance. End of quote. You see what's happening in our little happy jar? The evidence is starting to grow. You know what the evidence is doing? It's actually squeezing out the need for very much faith. So don't tell me you don't have enough faith to place that little faith that's required in Jesus. Because God is working for us because he knows we're idiots. He's working for us. He's trying to show us, come on, you guys. Cosmos, then morality. We'll be very brief with these last two. The moral argument for God's existence says this. The universal existence of moral belief implies the existence of an original moral source. You know, everywhere you go in the world, and this is what this argument is essentially saying, everywhere you go, you find a universal belief in God or God's. Solomon, very wise man, he said this, God has hardwired us for eternity. He has set eternity in the human heart. And sociologists are impressed with how similar our, our attitudes are as we go from culture to culture to culture. Everywhere we go, people want justice. Everywhere we go, people say, but that's not fair. Why do they say that's not fair? How do they know it's fair? How do, how do they know that there even is a fair? Everywhere you go, people say, come on, you promised. Who told you that putting your word on the line was important? C.S. Lewis argues that moral laws are not any different than mathematical laws. You can't have your own math. Try getting away with that in math class, kiddos. Just next time you get red marked on your math test, say, oh, that's your math, teacher. That's not my math. <laughs> you say, that's ridiculous. Well, same thing is ridiculous when it comes to people saying, well, that's my personal truth. That's my moral code. You don't get to decide that. God has wired you a certain way. You suppress that. Oh, yeah, you can suppress it all you want. Just remember that the wrath of heaven is being revealed against people who suppress truth. I don't want to be on that side of the fire line. God has given us the same basic rules in some form, and they emerge from culture to culture to culture and have throughout history. In fact, when Paul wrote the Romans again, he's talking about the Gentiles, right? Gentiles did not even get the Jewish law. But the Gentiles who do not have the law, he says, they're doing the law as if they were wired for it. They're a law for themselves, even though they don't have a law. They show that the requirements of the law are written where? On their hearts. I got a question. Who wrote them on their hearts? Why do our consciences bear witness? Sometimes our thoughts accuse us. Other times our thoughts defend us. But where did we get that? Moral argument for God's existence. More evidence. And then the last one. Be done here. Experience. Some of you guys don't have an experience with God yet. So you're stuck with less evidence. You're stuck with the, the cosmological, teleological, moral evidence for God's existence, which, by the way, should be absolutely all you would need in order to take that next little step of faith. But for those who have taken that little step of faith, why are we so happy? Because we have an experience with God. Man, that sealed the deal, didn't it? I could talk to every one of you who have had an experience with God, and I could not talk you into not believing in God. That's the ultimate argument that he exists. That's the ultimate argument that we can know him. The psalm of Psalm 34, I sought the Lord, and you know what he did? He answered me. I was afraid. He delivered me from all of my fears. What is the psalmist saying? I have an experience with God. I have a relationship with him. Can't tell me he doesn't exist because he's like my friend. Those who look to God are radiant. They're happy. Their faces are never covered with shame. The poor man called out and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. 
Man, you were bankrupt spiritually. You called out to God. He saved you. You've had an experience with him. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. He delivers them. God protects us. And then at the end of that sequence, what does the psalmist say? You know what you guys need to do? You need to take the evidence that God has given you already. Take that next step of faith. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in God. He is confident that God exists. God has delivered you. He's forgiven you. He's blessed you. That's why we share our relationship with God with other people, our oikos, those 8, 15 people sitting there on the front row. Why do we even tell them about this God? Because of what we've, we've experienced from him, what he's done for us. This is not an argument just to help people see that God exists. Now go on with your life. If you admit that God exists, here's the next question. What are you going to do about that? Man, think about that God exists and I'm not paying him any mind. I'm not giving him the time of day. I know you're out there, God, but I don't care. See, next, next time we won't talk about earthquakes, we'll talk about lightning. <laughs> See, you don't want to be that guy. And that's why this experience with God is so vital. Take that next step. And when you do, that little bit of faith that is required to take that step, man, now you've got all the evidence to fill up that happy, happy jar. You walk out of here a happy man, a happy woman. You never regret that decision. Never, ever ever, ever. Father, I thank you. I thank you for uh, just being there. Thank you, Lord, that you're there. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you stepped onto the timeline, emptied yourself because that was pretty humbling. But we appreciate that you did that to save us. But I just pray that anybody in these rooms, anybody online watching, listening today, I pray that we would all be willing to stop, take a deep breath, recognize that you're there, recognize the overtures that you made to us, the loving expression you gave us through Jesus, and that we would respond appropriately. And everybody's head bowed, your eyes closed. Uh, Somebody in this room, maybe, somebody somewhere listening, maybe, needs to admit that they're a sinner. It's a good place to start. A little humility never hurt anybody. Just say, Lord, I can't figure this out without you. I don't know why I've excluded you this long. Admit that you're a sinner, then believe that Jesus can save you. Because you know what? He really can. And then choose to place your faith in Jesus. It's a choice. It's a choice to take that next little step of faith. A little, little itsy bitsy step of faith. And stop trusting yourself for your future and place your faith in Jesus. Okay? Be a good decision. So, Lord, thanks. In Jesus' great name, all God's children said.